legislative reform. Ms. Schaefer, will you take the roll? Pulowski. Present. Pulowski, present. Wolgamot. Present. Wolgamot, present. Doubt. Present. Doubt, present. Freiburg. Present. Freiburg, present. Garofalo. Garofalo, present. Garofalo, present. Haley. He's in the waiting room. Haley. Present. Haley, present. Liz Lagarde. Liz Lagarde, present. Liz Lagarde, present. Moran. Moran. O'Neill. O'Neill present. O'Neill present. Pinto. Present. Pinto present. Sandstead. Present. Sandstead present. Moran. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Representative Wagamon, do you have a motion for us? Sir, I would like to move the approval of the minutes from Friday, February 12th, 2021. Representative Wogamont moves the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Thank you, Representative Wogamont. Uh, members, we're having a, an ex sort of extraordinary meeting here to catch up on work that we didn't finish on Friday, and we'll continue again on the uh, upcoming Friday. Representative Baker, uh, you want to continue where you left off, and I think you sent us a new graph based on metrics rather than simply just dates, so I hope the members have that. Um, I printed um, out the one you just sent about an hour ago. And, and so, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I think I might have missed uh, Representative Wogelmont on that. I was kind of going by memory. My, apo my apologies, uh, Representative, on that and others, if I didn't catch you. Um, what I wanted to do is to just signal after a lot of conversations with uh, many of you on this call um, over the last few days and over the weekend, um, hearing some of the uh, benchmarks on health, I wanted to add a couple of things on that graph, Mr. Chair. Um, I added a, a, a point of recognition of a uh, uh, million uh, vaccinations at a, at a point in our transfer here of the, of the draft that I'm sharing. And, um, Further, uh, like a two million hit uh, on, round, on or around May 1st. Out of those, as well as a, a seven day positivity benchmark that was important to the Minnesota Department of Health um, and our conversations with them. Uh, currently, the seven day positivity rate is about 3.8, 3.9. Um, I put in six. Uh, there's been many times during the last 11 months that the governor has made uh, movements uh, to the positive when things have been even above the 6% range. So I felt like it was a good benchmark for us to start talking about. Uh, so again, as I mentioned before, I know that there's, uh, I think my testifiers are back. I wanna thank them for returning to this. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I, uh, again, this, this, uh, this bill, which is now uh, jacketed and in my hands, it's going to be looking for signatures and it will, will be introduced on, on the House floor on this Thursday. So uh, to tell you there will be a House number uh, is coming very, very soon. Um, I think with that, Mr. Chairman, um, um, I have uh, shared a lot of my thoughts with members. I know that I'm working on a DE amendment already because things change almost weekly uh, with, with us focused on trying to find a plan uh, to develop this plan. And I think with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. And I think you had some, we had some members I know had questions before. So I want to make sure my testifiers get to that. Uh, Representative Baker, thank you. And uh, Representative Pinto had had a question uh, when we stopped. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, and maybe I'll, uh, just before getting to that, actually, just to follow up on a comment from Representative Baker, I just, if, if he could just clarify a little bit, I'm looking at the roadmap that was um, that was sent out to members. I don't know if it's been, it been posted as of yet, but if he can just talk a little bit about how that 6% positivity rate, seven day positivity rate would work. I'm a little bit confused um, with that, with the way he's laid out the roadmap. Sure, thank you. Representative Baker. Mr. Chair, thank you and Representative Pinto. It's just, it's a number that is very flexible and fluid. Uh, honestly, Representative Pinto, um, um, I chose that number because uh, according to our state Department of Health, five to 
is a, a range where they say is a cautionary place. That is an arbitrary number with the Minnesota Department of Health. That is not a national standard. Um, in fact, uh, I learned earlier today the state of Washington, um, again, led by a Democratic governor, has their cautionary mark starting at 10 percent. So that's a number that is uh, certainly I'm open to talk about. Uh, but again, as uh, the Department of Health has set out, sent out graphs to us before uh, and through our uh, Mr. Hoff, who was on the phone last time, sent out uh, benchmarks and pivot points on the graph when the, the governor has made uh, changes in the uh, business restrictions in the past. Uh, certainly he has done it when it's been up in the eight, uh, seven, eight percent mark. And again, it depends on a number of things, but what's going for us now, Representative Pinto, that we didn't have um, uh, several months ago was really the immunizations. You know, we're nearing a million right now for, uh, for uh, first time uh, shots. And so um, I put some of those in, the, in this bill too. So that's, an, it's, that's a significant thing so I felt like we could even be below some of the marks where Governor Walls has moved before. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Baker. And I have to say, I, um, I so much appreciate the tie-in with the health metrics, with, with looking at uh, both that, the positivity rate and your reference to, to, um, to vaccinations. Um, I guess my question right now is just much more kind of mechanical and narrow, which is just sort of how does that work? So if, if the positivity rate does go above 6%, um, just like mechanically, how would it work under your proposal? I guess I'm just, just trying to figure that out. Representative Baker. Mr. Chair, uh, to that question, I think what we'll work through with the DE amendment that's still being worked on, Representative Pinto, I would say that if, if one or two metrics triggered, let's say that all of a sudden the immunization stopped and for some reason uh, we had a problem uh, and the metric of six went up to six and a half or seven, it would engage, my intent is to engage the governor and the four caucus leaders to immediately get together to talk about what is the plan? Do we need to pause? Is everything okay? Is it an aberration? It would just cause that trigger moment to get together, and then that would be determined as to whether we need to pause it or not. Because these numbers are public, and the Department of Health posts these every single day, nothing should be a surprise to business owners, to citizens, to say, "Look, we are in a, we are in an, again another cautionary or high cautionary moment." Uh, so I think that uh, there wouldn't be any more surprises. It would just it would be. Uh, some mechanics like that, Representative Pinto, that I think would, would, would happen. And again, I, I, uh, I'm still working on how that detail will work and welcome your thoughts and others. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Baker. I guess I'm, um, so the bill as, as currently posted, the draft as posted, um, uh, allows the governor and the, and the four leaders to uh, delay or advance timelines kind of based on their judgment. I guess the piece that I'm trying to understand then is, is there anything that, that the change in these metrics would trigger other than simply, I guess, calling them together um, I'm trying to figure out sort of what kind of actual uh, affirmative effect would come other than simply having this group gather together, which of course they could choose to do, you know, regardless, right? They could just look at the numbers. So I'm just wondering in terms of, in terms of what you're working on, is there anything that is sort of more um, uh, concrete in that in terms of really pushing for a, um, for a change or does it simply call them together and they take a look and they kind of use their judgment at that point? Representative Baker. Um, Representative Pino, I think again, as my bill is, Early drafted, it says four out of the five members or those leaders, including the governor, would say, yes, we have to agree to this uh, in, in order to pause or to delay or not delay. I think the bottom line is, again, because the bill doesn't, doesn't uh, take away any of the emergency powers of the governor, he could actually step in and do whatever he wants to do. This is meant to be uh, an olive branch of sorts, a gentleman's agreement that says, I am committed to working with the legislature to working through a process to include both parties in both houses to see if we can work with uh, work on this together in when it's coming to a, a focus of business restrictions. So uh, simply put, it doesn't, unfortunately, in my mind, I wish I could remove some of those executive powers and really put the power on the majority of the five. I just know that that's probably gonna be problematic, uh, but I am very open to finding a, a way and a mechanism. But if the governor is willing to sign this bill passing out of both bodies, um, I sense that he would be committed to that and wanting to work with us as we've been begging to have this happen for the last several, several months. So that is really the intent of this, Dave. Um, I'm sorry, Representative Pinto. And uh, I think that we just are, are trying to find a, a starting place with this. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll defer to other members' questions. I'll just note um, 
uh, that uh, I really do, again, appreciate. Um, I, I think it's really important that we be tied to health metrics. I appreciate, um, Representative Baker, you you doing that and um, you know figuring out exactly how to do that, I think, is important. I will note that you know, if if metrics rise above a certain warning level, I guess I this member at least would really want to have uh, a more direct tie to say, boy, if we hit the if the alarm bells are ringing, um, that we kind of know that there's um, steps taken right then and there before things get out of control. So that'd be one piece I would be looking for. But as far as the direction that you're going here in terms of tying those pieces together to what's going on in terms of health and safety, that feels so important. And I really appreciate the um, the work you've put into this and a- eager to continue to work on it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Baker, I'm really interested to hear a little bit more from your testifier from the Hilton Hotel, Mr. Jarka. And I, you know, Hilton is all over the world. And he was talking about how Minnesota doesn't have a plan. And he talked about Nebraska specifically and how they had a plan to open and it gave them certainty so they could actually book and open up their business and, and have this roadmap. And so I'm wondering if he could tell us a little bit about what is happening around the United States or even around the world with the Hilton hotel system since he's connected to that network? Mr. Jarka, you want to respond? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually uh, went through and and reached out to some of my colleagues with uh, Hospitality Minnesota to kind of take a look at not just Hilton, but a bunch of different brands. So for example, in St. Louis right now, Um, at the the Marriott in St. Louis, which is the largest property, I believe, in St. Louis. They're actually sitting at 50% max occupancy um, right now. Um, And basically, their last weekend, and granted, it was a a holiday weekend, but they were up at 75% um, occupancy. They're allowed to go up to 50% for their groups um, at this point with proper social distancing. In Houston, Um, At at the Hyatt in Houston, they're allowed to go to 75% max occupancy at this point, and their occupancy, and granted, it was a snowstorm down there and still is, uh, they're at 33% occupancy. Over in Atlanta, they have no capacity right now, but they have restrictions. So there's actually 12 guidelines that they need to follow, and they are basically uh, spelled out basically with... um, you know, proper social distancing, using proper uh, hand sanitizer, and they list a whole bunch of different guidelines. In Omaha, which I mentioned the last time, they're actually at 75% um, occupancy uh, for their meeting space. And they're basically set up for proper social distancing in their space. Um, So that's what I I took, you know, went through and and looked at. But, you know, when when the... um, It was uh, someone from the health department last Friday, they were talking about, you know, what we need to be doing um, and kind of described, you know, what's happening at the hotels. Well, I was I was a little concerned because how they were describing what was happening is basically what you might see in a restaurant. Um, Basically, they were saying that, you know, people are socializing with masks off, eating, drinking that, you know, where is controlled. But. More importantly, that's not what's actually what's happening in our meeting space. 65% of my hotel is group, and we have meetings in place. I've mentioned that Hilton as an organization has partnered with the Mayo Clinic as well as um, Lysol, and we have systems in place. We have systems on how to clean our guest rooms properly, and it's called Hilton Clean Stay. And it's basically cleaning the guest room exactly how you would to the Hilton standard, but then we partnered with uh, Lysol and the Mayo Clinic, and we talked about, okay, what do we need to be doing? So Mayo Clinic said we need to hit all these hard surfaces. There's actually 10 that are the most touched surfaces in a guest room, including your remote control, door handles, um, faucets, and so forth in the room. Once the room has been cleaned, the room attendant would be backing out, using the Lysol product, wiping everything down, and then we seal the room to indicate that no one has been in this room and it's been sealed properly. We actually took the same method and we went down to our meeting space and we're doing exactly the same thing and it's called the Hilton Event Ready Program. And we're inspecting the guest rooms, we're, we're wiping things down with Lysol, we're partnered with our AV partner on property and they're doing the same thing with the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, auto 
uh, equipment in the guest room. We're, we're wiping down the tables, the chairs. We're wiping down the, the handles on the blinds. We're also communicating to our meeting planners that we need to think differently when we're having meetings. Instead of the groups actually getting up and moving, it would be better if your speaker moved and we could take care of wiping down the podium and wiping down the microphone and, and making sure that everybody is properly social distanced. We're also providing areas in the back of each room to make sure for those people that are not comfortable but need to be at that meeting, we're setting up standing areas you know, six feet apart so that they are comfortable as well. So we have systems in place. The Hilton here uh, at the Hilton Minneapolis, I've invited over a hundred customers to come on property to show how a meeting could be properly handled. And, and we went through every meeting space, every setup and, and from registration to um, what the rooms would look like. And people were blown away. It's also how you can serve food and, and do um, a, a, a buffet in, uh, you know, properly, which is really more action stations moving forward. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, that's incredibly impressive. I mean, that's a pretty detailed plan. And it sounds like there are locations all over the United States that are doing this and doing this safely. And so, I, uh, Representative Baker, I think you had someone else too that wanted to speak more about the plan. We want to know what is the plan so we can open up Minnesota so that we can have uh, security so, and safety, and we can also make sure that these businesses have some certainty as they're trying to reopen. So, Representative Baker, did you have another person too that wanted to speak to how the plan and, and how we can have some certainty for these businesses moving forward? And Mr. Jarka, thank you so much. That was really enlightening to, to tell this whole committee and really whoever's listening here in Minnesota that we can do this, you have an extensive plan that this is already being done all across the United States safely and effectively and with certainty. So thank you so much for that testimony, it was fantastic. Representative Baker, you want to go to your other witness? Well, again, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative O'Neill. Uh, the only other person I had on here was Ms. Raymer from Hospitality Minnesota. I'm not sure she had anything new to report. Um, I can I can share a lot of the, the data that um, Mr. Uh, Jarka just talked to as a, as a franchise owner myself of a hotel under the Wyndham Group. Um, I own and operate a Super 8 hotel. We do a lot of the same protocol. The national franchises have done tremendous amount of work on that. We, you can't walk in the door without hand sanitizers at every stop, at the, at the stairs, the elevator, that kind of thing. And, and so again, um, I'm not gonna go through the detail that Ken did, but again, it's, it's in the industry um, system-wide, but I don't have anything else unless Ms. Raymer, you have anything else to add to this? Ms. Raymer? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Baker. Uh, the only thing I would add is to amplify what Mr. Jarka said. Uh, we are allied with national organizations too, the American Hotel and Lodging Association and also the National Restaurant Association, both of whom came out very early with uh, reopening guidance and the safety protocols that you just heard about and our industry has been very focused on that, keeping our guests, keeping our employees safe since the beginning of this pandemic. In fact, many were doing this even before you know the March shutdown, as we were hearing about this virus, uh, you know, coming across our country. And so, again, uh, having a plan to help in a phased approach these business operators to marry that with their business plans, so that they can understand. Um, really, again, if this is predicated on stability, um, what the next phase will be and what they can start planning for in terms of their op operation and trying to very importantly get their occupancy rates back up and having these business meetings, as Mr. Jerka talked about, that are so important that, uh, again, people are looking out well into the future through the end of this year, and this is an opportunity for us as a state to retain that business. And so it's really important that we work collaboratively on this and find the right metrics that folks can agree to um, with the right flexibility in, in place to move up or down depending on the situation. All right, I've got Representative Lizago. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to the bill author, uh, Representative Baker, I wanna personally thank you for your willingness and commitment to uh, reach out to all of us um, over the last couple of weeks to ask for our, our input and uh, seek our counsel as you're shaping this. 
and for you to change from dates to, to metrics. And uh, I think that speaks volumes of, of your commitment um, to doing the right thing the right way uh, with inclusion. So that's exactly the type of uh, bipartisanship uh, the state of Minnesota needs moving forward. So I wanna give you kudos to that. Uh, the one question I did have um, when I look at your, um, your new uh, graph, it does state 10 p.m. and the governor currently went to 11 uh, p.m. Um, you're gonna increase, you're suggesting to increase, but would you then um, stay at 11 or would you go back down to 10? Representative Baker. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and Representative Lizagard, that, that's an example of, um, as things keep moving along, um, um, I would relook at this. Again, I won't go backwards at all. I would say that if the governor thinks it's 11, okay. let's make it 11. But what's more important to me, uh, Representative, is, is we get the event centers open to 50% or up to 150 more quickly than what the governor says today at only 50. To me, I thought that was more important. Uh, because I think even, even the operators that I have talked to say uh, we'd much rather have a gathering of a wedding or a funeral, something um, that uh, doesn't necessarily uh, focus on the, the late night, maybe the liquor, the dancing. They would rather do it with the, the dinner, the, the, uh, the father-daughter dance, the nice toasting that you all do. I think that's what they want to get to first before the rest of it opens up, and most operators would much rather have that because they think it's probably the right way to go uh, on this way too. So a uh, part of the DE would be like, let's, let's leave it at 11 o'clock, but I still want to push the 150. Representative Lizagard. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is for either Mr. Jarka or Ms. Bremer. Um, originally, I was going to give you the question, Mr. Jarka, regarding uh, some of the numbers you were talking about, about examples from different states. You kept, I heard a common theme of social distancing. That was something that most of those states had in common. Can you tell me if there was a common theme among any of those states with mask requirements? Mr. Jarka, we'll go with you first. Sure, yes, there was, um, it, it's highly recommended to wear masks. Um, in uh, Atlanta with the, the 12 guidelines, masks were required when you're in, in a, a meeting or a meeting room or a gathering. Um, and pretty much it was the same thing in St. Louis and Omaha as well. And I didn't see anything for Houston uh, when I did it, but um, I'm sure there's something there. Okay. So talking about but I do just wanna also point out uh, staying Hilton as a company has made uh, masks required um, at any Hilton. It does not matter what state your, your property is in. And we're seeing that across the board with a lot of the hotel companies. You want Mr. Mr. Raymer to respond? Please. Anstead, okay, Ms. Raymer. Yes, I, I was just going to say, too, um, again, the, the roadmap that we're contemplating, I think everyone is agreement that um, social distancing, masking, all of the pieces that are in place now and the sanitizing would continue well into the future. You know, we recognize that vaccination is going to be a key part of this so that we do reach that more of a herd uh, you know, immunity place. And those things all need to come together to be able to get us to, you know, 100% open at some point. But again, still, I think the fact that we would want to continue with many of these protocols, and we know that consumer confidence will really require that for some time into the future. Representative Sandstead. Mr. Chair, follow up, please, and thank you. My follow up would be for both of the testifiers, you reference basically larger corporations, larger franchises, and what practices are there perhaps. Could you comment on what you would envision for a small town Minnesota for somebody who doesn't have a Hilton, for somebody who doesn't have a Super 8 or something like that, especially in terms of restaurants? I'm very curious to hear about what would that look like to get that opened up in your recommendation? Maybe Ms. Raymer, you have an, an, you know, maybe that's your area of expertise a little more, I'm not sure. Ms. Raymer, you wanna start? Sure, thank you. Well, you know, I think all of this is very um, adaptable to all the different uh, hospitality concepts, whether they're rural or metro. And again, um, you know, being able to have these protocols in place to keep employees safe, to keep the customers safe, that's really been something that we have been um, working on, message on with uh, Commissioner Grove uh, and the roundtable that we've sat on since the beginning. And so, 
again, I think that's very applicable for the rural areas. And uh, again, I think many, they're already doing this. It would just be a continuation of the things that they have learned to do. Um, you know, and there's many other things like going cashless, um, as touchless as much as possible. All of these things that we've learned to adapt to with technology and putting that into good practice for us. So I don't think there's any difference really in terms of rural versus metro in that regard. Mr. Thank Jarkin. you, Mr. Chair. Ms. You yes. want Mr. Jarkin to respond to? If he would like to, yes. Sure, you know, it, it's not so much like Liz mentioned that it's about um, a large property or small property or rural, but you know, most, you know, pretty much all hotels are members of the American Hotel and Lodging Association. And um, they're one of the first organizations that rolled out Stay Safe, uh, you know, right in the very beginning of this pandemic, spelling out, you know, proper protocols. And I can tell you, Hilton actually, you know, the Hilton Clean Stay program took a lot of their uh, steps from um, the American Lo Hotel and Lodging Association. So everybody has access to this. Um, information and um, I, I, everyone that I'm aware of has put everything into place. No matter what your brand is, people are, we're, we're, we're all aware of what the, the virus is all about and what we need to do to control it. Um, and, and it's all about wearing masks and, and cleaning um, and, and doing proper social distancing. So we all have the same interests, but we also understand that there's a, we need to come and figure out a path forward in order to bring business back. I have to say though, you know, a lot of my employees are struggling. They're struggling financially. They're struggling whether or not if they can pay rent or how they're gonna pay COBRA at this point. And that's what this is all about, getting the employees back, getting the economy going again. Um, you know, I, I'm responsible for 500 employees and this weighs on me tremendously to get these individuals back at work. Representative Sandstead. I just want to say thank you to Representative Baker for the work, for the work he has been doing on this, um, working collaboratively. Thank you to the testifiers. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask um, just a little bit more to understand what's going on in other states. Because um, based on what was described, it sounds like it's more... Um, that those other states just have, you know, somewhat fewer restrictions than we do, as opposed to there being a, a, a set of plans exactly. I just wondered if, um, if either of the testifiers, maybe it's Mr. Jarko, having experience nationally, could just talk about about that distinction. Mr. Jarko, sure. You know, how, you know, we all have protocols that I described earlier, and it's just the matter of, you know, it's working. As as Hilton rolls this out. It's in every brand that Hilton has. We have 14 brands out there, every size property, and it's around the world. And we're rolling this out and it makes a difference. So at this point, Hilton is confident in having meetings again. If, if, it, if we weren't confident, we wouldn't be out there pushing and, and you know, still selling. So we are ready and we're open for business. The protocols that we've put into place by partnering with the Mayo Clinic and Lysol has really worked. And, you know, we're also, you know, like I mentioned earlier, every Hilton, no matter what state it's in, is masks are required. We're, we give out free masks at the front desk for those people that are coming in. We have proper signage throughout the property. We have QR codes, uh, you know, in the restaurants and on every floor in order to have that contactless experience. Um, we're thinking of, you know, we're, we're doing hybrid meetings at this point in order to, you know, break up groups at this point, because we do realize I can't have my 3,000 people here. We understand that. But what we're asking at this point is, how do we go from where we are today for 250 people uh, to get me back up to at least, you know, my ballroom with proper social distancing with four people sitting at a round table in a, in a ballroom at 25,000 square feet, I can have close to 900 people and yet I'm limited to 250. We're, we're, like I said, we all have the same interests at this point. We wanna have safe meetings and that's, you know, the last thing I want is to have somebody come down with COVID. We've been open throughout this pandemic and I have no exposure to, to COVID at this property. 
And yet we've been open um, all along because we're following proper protocol. It's now up to the governor to decide what we're gonna do. Can we move forward and can we open safely at this point? And I feel with the proper protocols that we have in place at my property, as well as all these other chains and other hotels, I feel it's time that we start moving forward. I'm asking at least to get to 25% for my meeting space, which will hit me, get me to my max occupancy with proper social distancing. That would make a huge difference. That would be able to bring back a couple of hundred employees at my property alone um, and, and get them you know, back to work. Ms. Raymer? Yeah, I would echo that. Um, again, the, the real opportunity here is uh, to be able to do this safely and um, to find the metrics in place. And we have been looking at other states and I think Mr. Jerker referenced Nebraska. Um, as having, um, you know, really taken advantage of something that we couldn't host here because they do have a phased approach. And it's, it's pretty uh, simple and elegant in terms of how it's laid out in terms of the phases. And there's uh, um, different places where if there's a change, you know, up or down, then they know what the next phase is. And if it's 25% or 50% or whatever. And I think that's really a helpful metric and a guide that we're looking for here is to have some of those kinds of uh, markers in place so we can signal the market that we do have this plan and we're committed to, uh, you know, keeping business here in our state as well as, uh, you know, keeping our people safe at the same time. You've heard a lot about that today. So um, it's really important that, uh, you know, again, the hospitality industry is very attuned to this, very highly regulated, always has been and heightened to the point now where this is uh, second nature to our employees and um, a really a wonderful opportunity now for us to take the next step to retain this very important business for the economy of our state. Again, um, over 100,000 people out of work right now, and we want to get those things back in, uh, employed and off the unemployment payroll. Representative Sandstead, do you have anything else? Representative Baker, do you want to uh, sum up? Oh, wait, hold it. Representative O'Neill, just put her hand up. Thank you. Representative O'Neill. Mr. Oh, Mr. Chair, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Representative Pinto. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think maybe my question, I may not have said it clearly because um, it was, my question was had to do with um, uh, the plant, there was references to other states, and I guess we're talking about governmental authorities as opposed to, because of course that's um, what we're talking about, um, that uh, whether the other state governments uh, have particular plans, and it seems like what you described, that, that what it is is that there are, just, there are fewer restrictions than in Minnesota, and I just want to make sure I understood um, uh, what you were referring to uh, regarding other states having plans. It sounded like it was that the, in those other states you referenced, I think you said Georgia and Texas and Missouri and Nebraska, that there are fewer restrictions and thereby allowing more activity at hotels such as, such as yours. And I just was, I was trying to make sure I understood that. Representative Jarkey, you want to answer that one or are you capable of answering that one? Um, I don't know if I'm capable of answering all that. Maybe I can defer that to uh, Liz. Yeah, and again, I think um, according to the American Hotel and Lodging Association, we're aware of a, at least a dozen or so states that have some form of a phased approach, and they're using that in combination with, uh, you know, the government to make decisions about how they move forward. And, you know, yes, there are some states that are wide open, um, but again, there's still all the protocols in place that we've talked about in, in most cases, and, um, you know, they've been very effective. So, I, you know, we're really, again, trying to find a way to uh, walk and chew gum at the same time here so that we can uh, really move this forward and, and be safe and um, have a planful approach so that our operators know, um, looking at the metrics that we've been talking about, what they can plan for, for bringing their employees back and for uh, really looking ahead to their business so they can have a, the best chance possible for success. It's going to be a long recovery. So... The sooner we get at this, the better for everybody. And we all want the same thing, safety, security, and job preservation. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess um, what I was trying to understand is there was a lot of reference both in the last hearing and this one to other states having plans and implication that Minnesota doesn't have this, those same plans. And it seemed like the difference that I was hearing anyway is just there are other states that are, that have, are less restrictive 
um, on the businesses you've described. I totally understand that's obviously a, just a, a, a huge burden and concern. Um, I'm concerned, of course, with the balance with, with public health as well, and we're trying to find that balance to give people the confidence as well to, um, to go to businesses. I'll, I'll just note that um, of the four states that, that you referenced earlier, they all have higher, in some cases, significantly higher um, daily um, uh, average death rates in the last uh, seven days you know, um, in, in recent times. And um, just recognizing that there's a real balancing act we're trying to strike, that it may be that some of those states are accepting fewer restrictions and then also or having fewer restrictions, which is good, but then also accepting potentially a higher rate um, of infection as well. So this is a challenging balance we're trying to strike. Um, I really appreciate the information you provided. And again, Representative Baker for, um, for trying to put, bring this forward. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Representative Baker, Baker, you want, wish to sum up at this point? Um, I see one more hand up, uh, Chair Pulowski. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative O'Neill. Sorry about that. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. I actually was going to ask something similar to what Representative Pinto just ended with, which is uh, we kind of started this whole conversation, um, the prior hearing about other states and that they have a phased opening plan. And I heard uh, Ms. Raymer speak of that multiple times. And also Mr. Jarka talk about this phased reopening plan that many other states have a plan that the governors have laid out that says, you know, here's phase one, here's phase two, here are metrics. And so I guess my question is to Representative Baker, and maybe you're gonna say this in your closing, but I'm assuming you've talked to other states and looked at other states and to see you know what do they have for their phased open plan? And we don't have, and we don't we don't have a plan. <laughs> Our governor doesn't have a plan. He just he lets people know like in two days or four days or a week, you know, oh you can go to this capacity now, which isn't enough as we we've, we've said multiple times for businesses to react, particularly food industry businesses, restaurants and bars, because they have to purchase product. So I'm wondering, Representative Baker, in your closing, could you talk about other states, if you, I'm assuming you've looked at other states that they actually have a plan to open. And if you could uh, let us know about that, I think that's kind of what Representative Pinto was getting at. And if you could just help clarify that. Representative Baker. Um, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative O'Neill. And this, this can kind of wrap up my closing too. I know you have another couple of bills to hear. Um, what I have learned is every state does it a little different. And there's 50 some plans and some have, um, some have steps uh, and plans to, to get back to normal. Some are more normal today than they have been in a long time. And some are, not many are as restrictive as Minnesota. Uh, what I learned from, from the Department of Health and their experts have been diving into this for, for obviously many, many months is that um, a lot of states have arbitrary numbers that they found important. Again, like I, I commented to the state of Washington, their cautionary line is at 10% of positivity rates. Ours are a little bit lower. I don't think anybody was arguing that because it was our state, it was our plan. But now today, so many months later, what we have to focus on is what can we do in Minnesota to get our economy back on track, to get our workers back to working. Um, again, downtown Minneapolis is gonna be very focused on other outside things coming in. The best thing that we can do for them right now is to start giving them a chance to get back to work and to start uh, filling uh, hotels like the Hilton and others down there so that they can start seeing some recovery in, in their in their pathway to this as well. So um, again, every state has a different plan. I'm focused on our plan. I think Minnesotans have gotten it. Businesses have understood the importance of doing a good plan with everybody that walks in the door. My final comments, Mr. Chair, would be, um, again, um, uh, we are still working on the right method of this plan. We just need a plan. And uh, uh, the, the DE is going to be worked on. The, the house file number will be very, very shortly. I hope that we can put this on a pathway. And my, my request to the chair would be, I know you can't do much with a bill that doesn't have a number on it, but if, it, if it's going to come through this, will it come back through this committee, Mr. Chair? Will it go to the workforce committee? I need to make sure I start greasing wheels because I'm in an urgent matter to get this thing done and out of here because the Senate is working on the same kind of a plan. If Mr. Chair, you could give me your roadmap to my roadmap, I would appreciate uh, maybe what that looks like to you. Representative Baker, as I understand it, your bill would be referred to the Rules Committee and then sent down to us. But even though we might not be in possession of the bill, 
whatever the draft is, we'd certainly work off of. For instance, we've worked off of several drafts already. I would hope that at some future point, maybe as early as Friday, we can begin to construct a bill in this committee that we can then pass up through rules and then to whatever committee would have to go after it left rules. So again, as I said in the beginning, my intent was to engage the legislature. I think the legislature is engaged. My other intent was hopefully to find things that worked. And the only way to do that was to do it in a bipartisan way and to see what was offered in committee with public testimony. And we have done that. So we have a number of options available to us. We have Representative Haley. We have Representative Doubt. We have your bill. We have uh, Representative Sandstead has already gone through several drafts from last Friday. And we've seen the final drafts, or maybe not the final drafts, but those that we'll take a look at tonight. I think Representative Lizagard is also working on some. So hopefully with all of that, we will come up with a bill that we can move forward. I'm confident that we will. So and and thank with, you, Representative Baker, for your work. And really, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for allowing this uh, extra time today, too. This is super important. I appreciate the clarity on this. Thank you so much. No, it, uh, it has helped, I think, everyone. Representative Sandstead is next. And Representative Sandstead sent to us some new drafts, just as Representative Baker was working on new drafts, too. So, Representative Sandstead, you want to tell us what you're working off of, and members, if you have them either on your computer or if you printed them off, she'll uh, relate to us what they are. So, Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I am working off of two different drafts. The first one is entitled CS043, and this is basically what I'm referring to as a Chapter 12 rewrite. And the second draft is CS044. And that's what I'm referring to as basically a pilot program for opening up restaurants. Which one do you wish to proceed with first, Representative Sands? <laughs> I apologize for my dog, one moment. I would prefer to start with uh, <laughs> chapter 12 rewrite, CS043. All right, Representative Sandstead, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What this bill does is basically adds another section to current Chapter 12 um, language. Uh, section one of this draft amends Section 12.03 by adding a subdivision that adds the term public health emergency to already existing language, and then it defines it. It also clarifies the effective date to be the date following enactment. Section two of this draft language amends section 12.31 subdivision two to include the words pandemic and other public health emergency. It creates a new section entitled section C that basically functions as a management phase for when a peacetime emergency extends beyond the 30 days. In this management phase, the legislature asserts its role as a co-equal branch of government in a couple of different ways. It does it by requiring um, the governor for, exist for existing executive orders at that time, the governor would have to provide a rationale and identify specific legal authority for each order or rule in effect and promulgated by the governor in response to the part, or peacetime emergency. These executive orders or rules would expire on the 37th day of the peacetime emergency unless approved by a majority vote of each house of the legislature. Following that, it says executive orders or rules issued by the governor after the initial 30 days of a peacetime emergency would be handled in a very similar way. The governor would have to provide a rationale and identify the specific legal authority for the proposed changes, and the legislature would approve these changes by majority vote of each house within seven days, or those executive orders and rules would expire. Finally, the draft language states the language would become effective the following day, final enact, following enactment, and it applies to the current peacetime emergency we're in and peacetime emergencies that could be declared after that date. It clarifies that executive orders currently in place as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic 
um, would expire seven days after the effective date of this section unless they were approved or ratified by the legislature under paragraph C. So that's a brief description of the bill. Members, or it's not a bill, it's, it's draft language. It's all right, it's a draft language. It'll be a bill at some point. Uh, members, questions? Representative Freiberg, I have is first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for working on this, Representative Sandstead. I know you're um, very concerned about your constituents, and I appreciate that you've put a lot of effort into this to help them out. Um, you know, just looking at this, it seems kind of similar to some of the proposals we've seen uh, where there's kind of a date set um, by which, and it, at that, you know, we, we've had some discussion about whether or not it's better to use metrics or whether it's better to use dates. Um, the, you know, the proposal we heard earlier uses some health metric, was considering some health metrics. Um, but then, you know, after this date, then, you know, then it expires unless approved by the, any uh, executive orders will expire unless approved by both houses of the legislature. I mean, I guess I have some concerns with that uh, requirement. I mean, I know, and I know we've talked about this in the context of other proposals too, and I know Representative Liz Lagarde mentioned he was interested in a proposal that where basically one house would have the approval to, would have the authority to potentially approve uh, an executive order. Is that something you've looked into at all, or w would you be supportive of a proposal like that? Thank you, Representative Rep Freiberg, Rep Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would be open to that. And for clarification, I think Representative Freiberg, the health metrics that you were describing are for the next bill that I'll be presenting on or the next draft language. Um, but I don't think we need draft language or metrics per se for what I'm proposing in um, this particular draft. I also want to say, Mr. Chair and members, it's my hope that by bringing this draft language to you tonight, we can use the rest of this time as a working session to work together to actually build a bill. Um, I know that this is something that the chair has put out to all of us many, many different times. Um, I would really love to do this in a publicly um, transparent way, a very bipartisan way. And again, just to remind people that might be listening in, um, in the public, this is really the fourth meeting that we've had. So this is the first time we're trying to flesh out these um, issues in a public hearing, in a public setting with input and testimony, and um, it's a very difficult process. So again, I have thick skin. In no way am I claiming uh, this draft language is perfect. I'm looking to build this together. Representative Freiberg, I have been in contact with Rep Representative Liz Lagarde. I am open to any amendment that he could bring as well as others. I've been in contact with Representative Baker and Representative Haley to work on different ideas. Um, so yes, I'm very, very open and I encourage amendments. I encourage um, bringing language together and building this together. Mr. Chair. Representative Freiberg. <coughs> Excuse me. Representative Haley. Representative Haley, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll talk so you can get a drink of water. Um, thank, you. thank you, Representative Sandsteed. Um, and we did have a chance to talk this week about your proposal. I appreciate your work on this. And just wanted to call out in, in your bill, um, you're calling for a seven days that the legislature would have a chance to affirm an executive order. Um, which I think is fantastic. My previous proposal was 14 days and um, some members on your th side of the aisle uh, didn't like that. So we're, we're making progress. Now we're down to 70 days. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, for folks. Um, and I also appreciated that, you know, you, you are using the term that the legislature really is brought back to the table as a co-equal branch of government. Um, we certainly have bipartisan agreement on that that is uh, my objective as well. So um, I appreciate that, that work. And additionally, um, you are inserting language uh, under public health emergency or public health situation, which is also similar to language that um, Representative Doubt had in his proposal on rewriting chapter 12. So I think that's, um, I'm just pointing out three significant pieces of your uh, draft language 
that have been also presented by um, members on our side of the aisle and would like to um, continue to work with you. The one thing that I, I guess I would say as members of this committee that I don't think has any traction is, is um, you know, having it be only one body being able to pass or affirm an executive order or make any changes to a peacetime emergency. That um, I don't frankly think is worth our time. Uh, we drilled into that last week and I don't see us changing the constitution and becoming a bicameral uh, body. So I would just recommend that we, we move forward on these other areas that um, uh, are much more uh, possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Representative O'Neill. Mr. Chair, may I just Oh, comment. Yes, Sanchez, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Haley, I agree. Um, I think the seven day timeline in my draft is is probably problematic. It's it's a pretty tight turnaround. Uh, 14 days would be more reasonable. I'm certainly open to that suggestion as we build this bill. So um, thank you for bringing that forward. And, and I agree that and I admit this is not a perfect solution. But again, my hope is to continue to build this together. Mr. Listen, Chair, really, your hand is still up. So, do you want to respond? Uh, just to clarify, Representative Sandseed, I have no problem with the seven days. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Representative. Uh, Mr. Mr. Oh, Chair, Sandstead, go ahead. Before the end of the meeting, maybe if we could accomplish one thing, is just to say, is there consensus around seven days, fourteen days? Could we build consensus? That may wait till Friday, perhaps. Okay. I think we've okay. just taken a fresh look at this. Perfect. So, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Sandstead. It is a breath of fresh air. Thank you for bringing this bill. And I don't care if it's seven days or 14 days, frankly. I'm so excited that you're acknowledging that we have two bodies that both need to weigh in, and that now with this language, we are actually a co-equal branch of government with the governor. So this is fantastic. This is what we have wanted since we first started looking at this back in, I think maybe Representative Doubt started in June or May. Um, I'm not sure how long Representative Haley has been working on this. It's so long I can't even remember. Thank you. Finally, you're acknowledging the fact that we need to be a co-equal branch of government with the governor, that both bodies, both House and Senate, are important, that they both need to have an affirmative vote to allow that executive order to continue. That's incredibly important. That is a co-equal function that we should absolutely have. And honestly, I don't care if it's seven days or 14 days. Seven days makes us work really, really quickly and evaluate all of the data very quickly. 14 days gives us a bit more time. But finally, we're acknowledging the history of Minnesota. Like I had said last time, there have never, there's never been a time in Minnesota state history where one party, the Republican Party, has controlled the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. And so you have to acknowledge that aspect of Minnesota. We are a divided government. We are not always a divided government. There have been times um, where we're not, but we are, that's our history. And so I appreciate the fact that you have acknowledged that history, that you have, again, brought back balance from the legislature to the governor. Uh, so this is the best step forward that we've seen so far. This is fantastic. So, um, you know, if you wanna do 14 days, do 14 days, but what you wrote in there is absolutely critical and uh, to bringing back the co-equal branch of both. So thank you. And um, I don't know if there's consensus about seven days or 14 days. I frankly don't care which it is, but I think it's important. The other part is the most important part. Thank you. Representative Sanchez. I just wanna say thank you again. I think there's probably more support for a co-equal branch of government than uh, people may be aware of. I think we just have not had enough hearings, enough time um, to really bring this out. So thank you for your, your glowing accolades on that. And I look forward to continuing to work together and move this forward. Representative Lizagard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to the bill author, um, you've done an incredible job, put a lot of um, heart and research into this and I, and I totally appreciate it. Um, to Representative O'Neill's point, we acknowledged a long time 
long time ago for uh, seven months during the um, not so special special sessions that we needed to have a voice. And uh, underneath Chair Pulowski's leadership, this is the platform that we have been wait waiting for. And this is where the sausage is being made. And um, for, for uh, Representative Haley to acknowledge that all the different pieces that being put into this um, bill that Representative Sanstead just brought forward is exactly what this body needs to do. Both Democrats and Republicans coming together and flushing these these things out to, to, to bring a product that can we can get across the finish line. So kudos to you, um, Representative Sanstead, for all the work. Uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Representative Wolgamon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, uh, to the author of this bill or this proposal, Representative Sanstead, I really want to thank you for your work and your diligence in putting this together. Clearly, you were listening to your constituents. Clearly, you're listening to your business owners. You're taking their concerns, you're taking their stories, and you're putting them in a public policy. Uh, kudos to you. It's clearly reflected in the work that you're doing. To get on the specifics of your proposal, um, I would like to, to go back to what Representative Lissigard has mentioned uh, in this committee, um, in that if, if you take a look at the language, um, Mr. Chair and Representative Sanstead and members, uh, if you look at um, uh, line 2.29, majority vote of each house of the legislature. I share Representative Lissigard's concerns about giving one single body so much of uh, veto power, uh, giving the, the Senate, again, the concerns that I have with their judgment, both politically and personally, um, that has resulted in the loss of life. I continue to have those concerns. So if you know, you mentioned this, this uh, you'd like this to be a, a kind of a working session, Representative Sanstead, I would be uh, inclined to support your legislation um, if we're able to change that on 2.29 from each house of the legislature to one house of the legislature. Um, additionally, as I, uh, as I had mentioned when we heard Representative Haley's bill, I continue to have concerns about just setting these short-term um, arbitrary deadlines, so I would want to continue to work with you on that, Representative Haley. I appreciate your answer to my question and concern at last week's hearing, so I'm willing to work with, with both you, Representative Haley, and you, Representative Sansit, on figuring out what is the timeline where we can take action as a body, but still have time to get the information that we need to, to make good decisions and keep people safe. Um, but I do, I do like this. I think that uh, the getting approval from, uh, from one chamber um, will, would uh, incentivize much more interaction between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And additionally, I think that by having each of us go on the record, to being for or against uh, any certain executive order, I think it's just, um, you know, holds us accountable and we'll, we'll do a better job of letting our constituents know where we stand on these things. So anyway, Representative Sanstead, those are my thoughts and your proposal. I appreciate your efforts and I uh, look forward to working with you and, and working with members from both parties on this committee to, uh, to continuing this legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Representative Sanstead, you want to respond? Just say thank you. Representative Freiberg, you are next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, just a quick point of clarification that follows nicely with what Representative Wolgamott said. I thought he made a, I liked his suggestion for changing the language and agree with his reason for suggesting it. Um, it was suggested previously that there might be some sort of constitutional problem with doing so. I mean, certainly anybody can file a lawsuit um, alleging constitutional issues, but um, I certainly, picked up no uh, definitive answer about that there's a constitutional problem with that proposal. Um, in fact, it was kind of the opposite. Um, you know, there was a comparison made to the process of uh, confirmation of cabinet appointees. That's only done by one chamber. So there is a precedent for uh, one chamber approval of uh, certain executive actions. Um, and I think uh, amending the bill in this way, uh, amending the proposal in that way would be consistent with that. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Dowd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and and Representative. Sorry, you, everybody's moving around on my screen. Uh, Representative, when hands go up and down, they move around. Um, Representative Sandstead, uh, just a few quick questions for you, um, and I, I I mean these to be just kind of uh, in the sense of working session here. Um, if we can kind of figure out uh, what's going on in the bill. Um, so, in in my bill, I actually didn't allow a 
um, sorry, I've got two Zooms going on at the same time here. Um, I didn't allow a public health uh, or a pandemic to be allowed under chapter 12. I created a new section of, of law that gave the governor some ability under that and then a way that we would respond to those executive orders. Can you walk me through, you know, I can see the language, but, you know, in the language there's, you know, we're amending this section of the statute without me pulling out the statute books and seeing how it in interacts with all the other stuff. Can you walk me through just quickly, and I'm not looking for a super in-depth thing, but how would this really work? Um, can you kind of just walk me through a hypothetical scenario of, you know, the governor would declare an order and then this would happen? Representative Sandston. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Doubt, to the best of my ability, hmm. I'm leaving Chapter 12 alone for the first 30 days. After that, it basically creates a management phase. Um, I think more to your specific question, I did include the way the language is right now, it doesn't, it is my opinion, my impression, and from the testimony that we've heard before this, chapter 12 was not written for something that was basically longer than 30 days. And certainly we have learned that a pandemic, you know, goes far beyond that. So I have included the word pandemic in this language. Um, I think the the piece or the public health emergency was language that had been in statute in the years 2002 to 2005, but it did not include the word pandemic. Okay, I could be wrong. I think Representative O'Neill is mentioning it. 2002 to 2005, and then it was removed. So it's putting that back in there and then adding the word pandemic. The rest of chapter 12 basically functions for the first 30 days um, as it is right now intended. After 30 days, the legislature is going to get involved as a co-equal branch. We're going to be weighing in on executive orders. We're going to have a rationale and a justification for why those orders are needed. Um, and it, it just allows for basically a management phase for something like a, per, a pandemic perhaps that lasts longer than 30 days. Representative Doan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and then I think I understand the, the way that the, the legislature would be involved, um, having to kind of affirmatively vote to approve those. I, I fully agree with that. This was exactly the issue um, that I think, and I've, I've mentioned a couple of times now, I think this is the heart of the issue. Um, that's kind of outstanding. And this is this is what we as a as a body and, and as a legislature really need to do to make sure that we do have a voice in what's going on. And I think, you know, there are different ways we can do it. Certainly we could write the language to say that one body has to affirm it. Um, there is no precedence in law for that um, that I can find anywhere else. There's there's really nothing that we do. You know, there are some things in, in statute or excuse me, in the constitution, um, you know, and we talked about those at the last meeting, but there's really nothing um, no real precedent for having one body act on something. It's, it's actually kind of bizarre. Um, so I think we should probably set that aside and, and really get to the heart of why you would want to do that or why you wouldn't want to do that. Um, and look at what the, the actions or, uh, impact of that would be. And, and what I mean is it's great. You know, somebody mentioned here just recently, it's, it's great to get everybody on record, either supporting or not supporting an executive order. Um, I, I think that's true. I ultimately thought that that you you kick it over to the legislature for us to, you know, have a, a vote, and both bodies would have to vote. If if you don't have both bodies vote, if one if one body votes to extend it, the other one doesn't need to vote, and you never get them on record of being for or against it. So you actually wouldn't achieve that goal. Um, but the reason I suggest suggested it is it forces the legislature to be involved. It forces the legislature, it forces the governor to have to communicate with the legislature. And I like that part of your language um, on, on why he put the orders in place, what data he used. Um, he can have his commissioners come in and testify in our committee hearings. It forces us to have committee hearings um, and to actually take in that information. And I think, I think you actually um, kind of reduce the, the tension or the, fervor around politicizing these these issues if if there's actually really factual committee hearings and we're all seeing and hearing the same thing so i think that would be a really great uh result of of doing that um but ultimately i think you know both bodies you know need to take that that vote and and vote to extend it um in my language if one body didn't vote to extend it, the governor can certainly turn right around and, and issue the same order. Um, question for Representative Sandstead. If, if, if for some reason the legislature, 
I called that a pressure release valve in my, in my bill. Um, so that, you know, if something went awry, um, you know, it's a big deal for the governor to say, well, I'm going to issue an order that the legislature just ended, right? That's a big deal. And he's going to have to have a big reason to want to do that, right? He's going to have to have evidence and be able to make that case to the public. Likewise, the legislature is going to have to make the case to the public why they're ending one or, or, or vice versa. So, um, I'm wondering if, if Representative Sandsteed, if 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 you had thought through what happens if the legislature ends it, is does the governor just have the ability to start a new one right away, or how how do you envision that would be handled? Representative Actually, Sands. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, I have not thought through that. I think we would we would be making our statement on either approving or not approving an executive order. Um, Certainly, if the governor were to reissue one, we would be back within a very short window of time. Um, and he or she, whoever that person would be at the time, would have to be giving a rationale on why we should be extending it. I hope that answers that question for you. Representative Dowd. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Representative Sancid. I think so. I, I, I just think those are some of the things we kind of need to think through um, as we do put something together. If that happens on Friday, great. Uh, but, and maybe we take parts of this bill and parts of that bill and, um, and we kind of create something together. I would love that because I can't remember the last time that ever happened in the legislature. Um, and I'm guilty of it too, because I, <laughs> I ran the place for, for a few years. So, you know, and, and as much as we all want to achieve that, sometimes it's, it's not, um, we, we don't do as well as we could and should do. So I really hope we can. And, and this looks like a perfect opportunity to do it. Um, and actually I'll say, uh, the, that this chairman, um, I think, is is well enough respected on both sides of the aisle that he's capable of pulling that off. And, and so I hope that we can um, really challenge each other to do that and do it in a really constructive and productive way, because I think we can do this. Um, what I'll also ask everybody to do is just, I'm going to challenge you to think outside of where we are right now. Um, you know, I understand that you've got uh, one party in the governor's office and that same party controls the, the House of Representatives um, and you've got another party that controls the Senate. Um, what you'd be setting up if, if you allowed just one body to, to extend things um, is you'd be allowing one party uh, rule. And if you don't have, you know, and, and that really is just status quo to where we are right now. It'd be very difficult for one party to overrule uh, a governor, but um, you know, I think that I think that emergency orders rise to a level that is beyond partisanship and beyond. I mean, when you, when you're in a situation like this where it's an, an emergency and and it's a, a big deal like a pandemic, and we're talking about lives being on the line, um, I think people act differently when they're making decisions instead of just uh, chirping to TV cameras about those decisions. So I would really challenge everybody to to put out of your mind who's in control of what right now and, and how this would work in this exact situation and think about what, when you're writing statute i'm sure in 2005 they didn't envision what was going to happen or whatever year it was um envision what was going to happen in 2020 and 2021 um and i don't know that we'll ever perfectly envision what's going to happen beyond this year but um please uh try to put yourself outside of um the situation that we're in and, and, you know, Hey, can, can just the house of representatives and the majority that we have now back up our governor by extending every one of his orders. I don't think, and I, I think we can all be honest here. Um, I don't think that's going to achieve the legislature being involved in the process. Right. And I, I don't think that's going to change much from where we are right now. So if we want to really see the legislature involved, I, I think we've got to stick our necks out a little bit and, and, um, and say, the way that the legislature works is a bill passes the House, it passes the Senate, and then it goes to the governor's desk for a signature. Um, this would be a, a little bit in reverse because the governor would be issuing an executive order. But in order for the legislature to weigh in, the House was elected and the Senate was elected. Um, and to respect both of those bodies, I think you, you have to understand that um, you know, it, it should take both of those bodies to continue something. And an executive order should rise to that level, right? Something that has the I mean, think of what, what we're doing here. We're 11 months or whatever into a, a pandemic and into emergency powers uh, by this governor. And, and his orders have the full force and effect of law without legislative input. So I just want everybody here, take off your Republican hat, take off your Democrat hat, and just think about the fact that a governor, read our constitution, read how laws are made, 
and think about the fact that we have a governor that can issue orders that have the full force and effect of law. Now, how should the legislature interact with those um, and what's appropriate? And we together need to need to put our heads together and, and find it out. I, I do like your language, uh, Representative Sanstead. I almost called you Julie. I, I, sometimes we get informal in the legislature. But, um, but Representative Sanstead, I, I do like your language. I'd probably change a couple little things here and there. But um, in, in essence, I think you're, you found the heart of the, the same issue that I did. And, and I think in order for us to have an influence, um, it is the heart of the issue is the legislature must vote to extend either the powers or the order or both, um, and I, I like where you're headed. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Sandstead, you want to reply? Yeah, I think thank you're you. Muted. I was, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Doubt, I agree with what you were saying uh, for the very most point. I also wanna say again, for all of the members, I do invite your language. I am open and I welcome your suggestions. So please stay in contact, let's build this together. And I agree, we should be iron sharpening iron in this process. And this is not for us, this is for history in the future or for our future, it is for generations to come. And just to comment, um, as I drafted this language, it was specifically not for today, although it could be, it could impact the current situation we're in, but it was really intended to be forward looking. So another legislature, another group in history or in the future doesn't have to deal with this. Representative Garofalo, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, is it Representative Sandstead or Sandstead? Silent E at the end. So which one is that? Sandstead. Yeah. Sandstead, okay, so I was saying it right, good. I thought that maybe for a couple of years here, I had been saying your name wrong. So uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Sandstead, um, thank you for your work on this. Um, I do want to repeat something publicly that I have said to you privately and in all candor um, is that I think this bill goes in the right way, but there is zero chance that your DFL colleagues or DFL leadership are going to let your bill come up for a vote. Zero. The idea that your DFL call, uh, our legislative colleague, Representative Wolgamot, or as I like to call him, Tim Wall's voting drone number 14, the idea that they're gonna allow this to come up for a vote in any way or any bill that in some way is going to limit the governor's authority or be seen as a repudiation of the decisions he's made is just not gonna happen. In this polarized political climate where it's tribal voting and blue team versus red team, that is this, the sad reality of the situation. Now, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish that this committee was actually voting on proposals. I wish they were being scheduled on the house floor. But as we saw yesterday on something as critical as public safety funding, where a minority of the majority was able to block the legislature from even the House chamber from even voting on $35 million of public safety funding, you understand why I think I want to see your talents and energy used in a productive way. There's zero chance your DFL colleagues are going to let us vote on this. And that's just reality check. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Wolgamont, coincidentally, you're next. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Sand said again, as we're in a working session, I just want to give feedback. There's been talk about um, what Representative Doubt mentioned about you know needing, you know, wanting to to continue your language there on 2.29 about majority vote of each house. Again, I just would like to further explain why I support the the idea and the language that Representative Lissigard has put forward on having it be just one of the one of the two bodies. Um, again, I, I think that when we're in a state of, of public health crisis, when we're, um, you know, in a state where there's action and resources and flexibility needed to save lives, I want to make sure that we are taking politics out of this. I want to make sure that we aren't having a situation where we can have one single body who is using actions that can save lives is political bargaining chips. For example, okay, we'll pass the mask mandate, which saves lives if you do this. Okay, we'll we'll support your um, executive order on eviction moratoriums if you do that. Um, I just I want to make sure that that we're not in that kind of situation. I think that we are do best if if we can be set up and and reform this uh, uh, reform these executive powers in a situation where again we have the governor working with the legislature. We have 
legislators going on the record, whether you're for it or against it, you know, at least there's accountability, at least constituents know where you stand. I think that's great. But again, I just, I really want to uh, stand up for Representative Listigard's language, make sure we're taking politics out of this, make sure we're in a position to respond in, in real time and save lives. And um, again, that's why I support that, uh, that one little word change there on 2.29. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if, you know, Representative Wolgamott uh, would, I'd like to just ask him a question about that and, and what he thinks would be different. What would be different? What, how would the legislature be involved then? Um, that to me, what you're, what you're suggesting, having one party do this, um, maybe I'll just make a statement about, and I made a little note here while you were saying it, you wanna take politics out of this. Um, so you so you want to leave it in a in a scenario where just one party can control things. If you want to take politics out of it, um, you you got to go back to our constitution. You and you got to just say, is the legislature? That's what we're talking about here. Is the legislature going to have a voice in um, in an executive order after a certain amount of time? Right. So the legislature is the House and the Senate. If you just take one body of the legislature. What you're doing, and I can summarize that a little differently, you're saying just one party then. So one party that happens to control one body of the legislature and the governor together can just do whatever they want. And to me, that's exactly status quo. There's no change to what we have right now and we'll have no meaningful involvement in the process. Um, and and I, I'd love for you to challenge me and tell me I'm wrong, but here we are in 11 months of this and we really still have had no meaningful hearings on any of the executive orders. Um, and when we do have hearings, what we have are, are people from the governor's office coming and explaining to us why these executive orders are, are really great. Um, so my question for you is, why do you think that would be any different? And, and how do you justify in precedence anywhere else in statute that we would have just one body of the legislature extend an, an emergency order? Representative Mogelman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Representative Dowd, again, um, I, I didn't say that we should change it to one party. 2.29, I didn't say change it to one party in the legislature. I said just change it to one house. Now, I'm, maybe I'll take this as a, a note of confidence to yourself that the DFL is going to maintain the House majority for many more by any to come. Maybe that's what you're implying. So I uh, can't disagree with you on that. However, um, again, I, I think that, um, so yeah, no, I've not been suggesting changing 2.29 on this proposal that Representative Stansett has put forward to one party. Um, I think that it, it is making significant change by having a legislature go on the record for these executive orders. Um, again, if, if, you, if you read the, the proposal that Representative Sands had put forward, um, there are several points where she talks about the, the, the executive branch, you know, having their rationale, having their specific legal authority for each order rule. Um, this Representative Sands' bill would increase in statute interactions between the executive branch and the legislature. I, I don't think it should be one party, but I do think it should be one house. Again, for all the, for all the reasons that Representative Listigard has put forward, I think that that puts us in the best position to be on the record, the legislature being accountable to our constituents, the executive branch engaging with the legislature and making sure that, that we are all working together to solve these things without giving one single chamber the chance to play politics with this, without giving one single chamber um, the ability to hold things up, to play politics, to negotiate in bad faith with people's lives. Uh, that's what we're seeing now happening with the Senate. Um, you know, I, I don't know who's going to control any chamber in, in two years from now or 10 years from now. Uh, I, I know that as little as you do, but I do know that we need to make sure that the, that the legislature and the governor are working together to respond to a pandemic or, or any sort of uh, crisis is outlined in Representative Sansa's proposal. We need to make sure that we're being um, accountable on the record for which executive orders that we support. And that's why I, that's why I've mentioned those changes to this language. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Doubt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Representative Wolgamont, if you could just go answer the part of the question, you know, I understand, you know, how you feel about this and that you don't think you're being political. 
um, I just I just invite you to to look outside of your step outside your shoes right now, um, because what you are saying by saying one party in the current situation is, or excuse me, by saying one body in the current situation is you're saying one party. But I'd like you to answer my question about where in statute, where's the precedence that, because what we're talking about is getting the legislature involved and the legislature is defined as the House and the Senate. Um, so what you're talking about is only engaging part of the legislature and not the whole legislature. Do you have some precedence in statute somewhere else where you think that is in place and where it is working? I, 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 total, I think it's completely unprecedented and I, I can't believe, you know, we'd even think about it because it does, I, I don't think it would pass constitutional muster first of all, but I mean, I, you know, we can write it in statute. We can write whatever we want. I've, you, you wouldn't believe the stupid things we put in statute over the years because somebody thought it was a good idea, right? Doesn't, doesn't mean it actually is, but, it, but this is actually a pretty serious thing. The legislature is the house and the Senate. So if you want the legislature involved and the legislature to have a voice, what you're saying is by only one body, that's not the legislature. That's just part of it. Um, so can you, can you tell me why you think, I mean, again, where, where in, in, in statute or precedence is there for that? And, and why do you think it's okay to change the definition of legislature or, or only engage part of the legislature, not the whole thing? Representative Wolgamont. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Dowd, uh, I, I do think that both in, in, I, I maybe should have clarified this. I do think it is, it would be a good positive thing for both. Uh, for both chambers to go on the record, to take up these votes, to, to um, you know, be able to tell their constituents, tell Minnesotans, hey, we support this. No, we don't. I, I do think that both um, bodies should do that. I don't just think it should be one or the other, so maybe I should have clarified that. Um, but I do think that for the executive order to remain intact, that it should take um, just one uh, approval for one of the chambers. I do think both should go on the record for that. And I, I know that you, your point is that, you know, we do everything together as a legislature. You know, there's no precedent. There's no constitution. The House and Senate should have to do everything. Um, how do you feel about the Senate um, being able to vote on the appointment of commissioners? Are you, are you willing to sponsor language that the ho both the House and the Senate should vote for approval on commissioners? Um, how do you feel about the, uh, you know, bonding bills or revenue bills originating from the House? Are you, because of the sentiment you're expressing, are you going to be putting forward legislation for both the House and the Senate to, uh, to be, um, to, for those bills to originate from both chambers? Um, there are many precedents within our statutes that um, give, give um, both of the different chambers, uh, you know, separate and, and, and different capacities and, and are, are individualistic in the rights as chambers. So, uh, those are just a few examples, Rep Mr. Chair, Representative Dowd, of where we have in statute um, different chambers having their own individuality. Um, I, I'd be interested if you would put forward legislation for that. But though, to answer your question, I, I do think that both chambers should be on the hook to vote uh, up or down on executive orders. I think that's a good positive thing. And I do think there are examples of different chambers um, um, having individual powers and authorities in state statute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Dowd. All right, before I go to Representative Dowd, we're down to less than eight minutes, and I've got three other members who wish to say something, so I'll go back to Representative Dowd, but then I would like to proceed to the other members, and hopefully Representative Sansic could get a summary in here before we end it. So Representative Dowd. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize. I, I really thought we were gonna have some working session here and not, this has been kind of a waste of time, this questioning back and forth. I do appreciate that Representative Wolgamott listened to my speech in the last hearing where I brought up those exact examples and I uh, spoke about why they're not the same as this. Um, and, and I did ask for examples. There is no example in statute. I have I've asked around, I've asked our nonpartisan research. I, I don't know of one and I don't think there is an example in statute where we would have one body act on something like this to extend it. Um, the things that he's uh, pointing out, I pointed out at the last meeting and, um, and I did that uh, and explained why those, those weren't the same. Um, and our constitution gives us those rights. Um, and, and, and they're specifically defined as rights uh, of, the, of the House and the Senate in our Constitution. Um, and I think we need to go back to our Constitution also to look to the fact that the legislature is defined as the House and Senate. There is no scenario where the House passes a bill, the governor signs it, it becomes law. That's, that's not, there is no precedence for that. Um, and, and I understand that one party right now controls the House and the governor's office. Um, and I know that people, you know, want 
to say that the governor was elected, so he should get to do all this stuff. Uh, but the Senate was also elected right now, too. And I'm, I'm disappointed that we can't look beyond which parties are controlling things to actually understand the definitions in our Constitution. Representative Freiberg, your hand is down. Did you? OK, you're off. Uh, Representative O'Neill, and again, we're down to about five minutes. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can be quick. This conversation is the most bizarre thing I think I've ever heard. We want to take politics out of this conversation. We don't want one party control, but we want things exactly as they are right now. We don't want the Senate involved because they kill people. This is the most, that is the most disrespectful comment, I think, of this entire four committees that we have met. You know, that is just so utterly disrespectful. So we are going to write the Senate out of Chapter 12 so they can't have any say because they're off on their, they don't align with what you think. So we're going to eliminate the Senate from making these, this is the most bizarre conversation. We started with something with Representative Sanstead's bill that actually made sense. And we have gone so far afield and so bizarre, I, I don't even know where we are right now. What we need is a co-equal branch with the governor. That should not go away when he declares an emergency. Representative Stansted's bill is about as close as we have come thus far with a couple small tweaks from Representative Doubt. As he said, we need to think about, well, what if the governor tomorrow, the next day declares the same executive order that we just ended. That's something that we need to consider. But there is no scenario under which one body of the legislature is going to control this moving forward. There is no scenario. So that needs to just that we're done with that conversation. So I, I would ask that we move on to things that we can actually do. If we actually passed a bill that said only one body needs to affirm do you think the Senate is going to pick up that and pass that bill? They are not. Why are we even talking about this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Haley, if you could be brief. I will be brief, Mr. Chair. Representative O'Neill covered my points. Um, we need to be serious about the work in this committee. We have had three serious proposals come forward. Representative Doubts, Representative Stansteads, and mine. I am willing to work with any of those folks on bringing the ideas from those proposals together. And I would like to know from you, Mr. Chair, how we get a bill uh, voted on out of this committee and to the House floor. And after four committee hearings, I hope we don't spend the next two uh, discussing the previous uh, uh, proposal again that has no chance of moving forward. So what is the plan? Really, I think I've already addressed that. And before I go to Representative Sandstead, I'm going to say this in reference to the comments that have been made tonight. I carried the higher ed bill in this body with a Republican all the way through all the committees, through conference committees, and to the floor with a Republican who was a joint co-author. We got well over 110 votes on the House floor on one of our largest budget bills. I'm chairing this committee because I've seen it done. I've done it. We are capable of doing this. So I am hopeful that we can, even despite tonight there was a little friction, but we've done this before. We are capable of doing it. And I'm, I'm very hopeful we will continue to do it. So Representative Sandstead, you have the final word as a summary and then we will adjourn the meeting. Mr. Chair and members, thank you so much for the opportunity to share this draft language with you. Um, again, I wholeheartedly believe if we are committed to working together, we can build a bill that will move this session. I believe that with all of my heart. I have sunk hours and hours and days and weeks into this. And if it was going nowhere, I would have given up long ago. I am not a glutton for punishment. I don't need to do that. Um, I will say that on any bill that is going to have the buy-in of members on both sides, there are going to have to be concessions. And I want you to know I have listened, not just heard, but I have in earnest listened to your suggestions, your rationales. I am taking that very seriously. I will welcome um, additional comments through the week. Um, 
if things come to you. So please don't hesitate to reach out on that. And a reminder that perfection, if that's what we're aiming for, is often achieved in steps. And I'm not sure we're going to get it perfect, but I am absolutely confident that we are going to be able to improve on this and come up with something that we can at least all agree on for this session. And it will be an improvement moving into the future. I would ask that you join me in committing to that kind of work so we can do this. Um, I will continue to drill down on some of the things I need to work on and clarify, um, but I am appreciative of the work all of you have done. I thank you for your comments and Mr. Chair, that's basically all I have to share. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you members and uh, I look forward to our next meeting on Friday and we will pick up with the uh, second Sandstead uh, proposal and then we'll see how we can package all of this into something that we can move forward. And with that meeting is adjourned.